Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. You answer as if you've gone to sleep. Say that hallelujah again. We'll rise up now as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We bless your name because it's a study of your word that makes the believer strong. Without the study of the word, our backbone will be like we have straw. We'll not be able to stand. And those who do not know the word, they're the people that easily compromise. They yield to temptation and yield to pressure because they do not know what to require in the word. But those who study the word, those who learn the word, those who live on the word, those who build principles of life on the word, they are the people that are strong and they are the people you can depend upon in these last days. Lord, we pray, I study tonight, you are beneficial to every one of us in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, we'll not be just learners and readers and hearers only, but we'll do us of the word. The grace to be obedient to the word, give to every one of us. Everything that is contrary to the word in our lives, knock away. And establish us in this word. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're now come to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be studying from Matthew chapter 5 since last year. There's so much. It's like the Lord has just packed together and compacted together the principles of the kingdom of God. And as you go from verse to verse, you're surprised how the Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ by spirit has packed so much into what we learn. Today we come to the end of chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And the verse itself appears very simple. But the verse is something that many Christians never think about. They never think about it, number one, because of the word perfect. And they do not understand what the word perfect means. And because of their own idea, their own understanding of the word perfect, they just conclude that's impossible for them. But in saying that's impossible for you, you accuse Jesus Christ of commanding you to do something not to be impossible. You accuse him that he's not balanced, he's not thoughtful, he doesn't understand what he should have told us. And he has told us something according to what you think that is not appropriate. And let all the world be wrong. Jesus is always right. And let all the doubters be liars, but Jesus is always true. And here are the words of Jesus Christ once again. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To start with, that's a command. That's an imperative. That's something it challenges everyone that hears him. And it says, this is what to be. This is how to live. And this is the goal that you have. And this is the thing you must be driving at. Whoever you are. You know all the people that listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. There were men there. There were women there. And he told all the women all the men. Be ye therefore perfect. Even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. There were some new people there. New in the kingdom. And there are some old people there, the people that have been following him from the very beginning. He began to talk about the kingdom. And he told the young and the old, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. There were married people there too. There are some people that think that when you are married, your life becomes so difficult. Living with an unbelieving wife, living with an unbelieving husband. There are people that were living in the neighborhood of others that made life tough and difficult. 
or people that were going through some real deep, serious temptations and trials and challenges. And he told all of them, whatever your situation, whatever your background, married or not married, whatever the pressures upon your life, here is the principle of the kingdom, here is the teaching of Christ, and here is the life of the kingdom. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now pick up that word, therefore. What therefore means because of what I said just now, what has he been saying? You have heard it had been said, you love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Because of what I said now, to love your enemies, be ye therefore perfect. As your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That means then that that verse 48 is actually an immediate conclusion of the verses 43 to 47. Love your enemies. Do you go to them that hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Be ye therefore, therefore, because you must be loving like your Father, because you must be caring like your Father, because you must be merciful like your Father, because you must be forgiving like your Father, be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect not only that number two that word that verse 48 is actually a conclusion of the whole chapter five blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are they that mourn and then blessed are they also that are peacemakers and the meek and they that hunger and thirst after righteousness and blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God because of that because of that because of all those beatitudes and because of the kind of life a child of God has to live be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect actually if you look at that verse 48 it's a conclusion of the whole of chapter 5 that because of everything I've been teaching you, and because of the demand of the righteousness of the Lord, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Not only that, this verse 48 is actually the goal of the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. As we come to chapter 6, it says, When you do your arms, don't be like the Pharisees, the hypocrites that will sound the trumpet and attract attention that they may be seen of men but you relate with your heavenly father who gives us everything he gives us without any form fear and without making any noise therefore when you give be ye therefore perfect as your father who is in heaven is perfect and then he goes on and he talks about prayer. And he talks about your treasures here, not only here on earth, but in heaven. And he talks about your eye being single, having a heart that has a purpose to please the Lord alone. And then he talks about no worry, no anxiety. And then he says, seek he for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the conclusion is, all I'm telling you, just be like your heavenly father. No worry, no anxiety. Knowing that God is in charge of the whole of earth and the of eternity be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect it comes to chapter 7 and as you look at everything he's telling us in chapter 7 the whole conclusion is in fact he says all the law and all the prophets compounded in this that whatsoever you want other people to do unto you do so unto them in fact the conclusion is be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect now but let's go beyond the sermon on the mount and look at the whole of the creation why did god create man originally let us make man in our image and then he's saying adam and eve you know what i wanted to reproduce somebody just like us like the father the son and the holy ghost 
I wanted to have some human beings living on this earth that their picture, their portrait, their lifestyle will be like the Father in heaven because of creation. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. But you know that man fell. And when men fell, fell from grace to grass. And then they could not live the way they ought to live anymore. And God planned salvation, redemption. And Jesus Christ came into this world. Why did Jesus come? Here is the purpose of redemption. Here is the reason for the atonement. Here is the reason why Jesus Christ died. To bring us away from the world. And bring us back to the Father. And he says, because of my atonement. Because of my redemption. Because of the goal and the purpose of salvation. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And now he died on the cross. On the third day he rose again. And then he said, don't leave Jerusalem until you do a perform on high. Because not many days since the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Why did they have the Holy Ghost? To have strength. To have power. To bring the supernatural from the throne of God and bring to their heart. Why did they need the supernatural? So that they have more help to just be like the Father. All the intention of the Lord for creation, for redemption, for glorification. Everything that the Heavenly Father has done and given us the goal. The purpose is so that you'll be like the heavenly father. And it says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. You carry a Bible in your hand. And then you wonder, why has God given us the Bible? All these Genesis to Malachi to Matthew to Revelation. Why do we have the Bible? To help us to see what it means to be perfect. Look at Second. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That is it. That's why you have the Bible. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And then you know as we have uh, As we have by the Bible We also have the church And the Lord has given us these uh, Preachers and workers And leaders in the church and, and sometimes you wonder Why do we have so many preachers And so many leaders These apostles and the prophets And the evangelists and the pastors And the teachers and all these people Every time they come with message And preaching and exhortation And challenges and encouragement Why? Why has God given them to us In Ephesians chapter 4 Reading from verse 11 And he gives some apostles And some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. The whole, the whole reason is be therefore perfect. As your father which is in heaven is perfect. Creation, the purpose is to be like the heavenly father. Be perfect as a father. And then when men had fallen and Christ came, the coming of Christ. The reason why Christ came is to lead us to perfection. And then he has, he has given us the Bible. And the reason for studying the Bible is not just to have knowledge in the head. It's be ye therefore perfect. Even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. And now he's giving us all these ministers and all these leaders that are preaching and ministering to us. And the reason why we have all those ministers. They're not just to tickle our ears. They're not just to fill in the time. They're not just to be religious activity. It is to remind us that the purpose of creation, the purpose of redemption is to be perfect. And then to lead us in the messages they give, in the challenges they give, reminding us, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, the church became established. 
and I will have the church in Rome and the church at Corinth and the church in the province of Galatia and then we have the church in Ephesus the church in Philippi now we have the church over there the church in Colossae then we have the church in Sardis and all these other churches and our activities are going on and, and the, uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is looking from heaven and is looking at each of the churches one by one on what basis will he be examining those churches? What is he looking for? In Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen those things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. You see that? He said, church, I'm watching you, church, I'm looking at you, church. I'm examining you, church. I'm looking at the lives of your members. I, have you forgotten the reason for the establishment of the church? It's so that you'll be perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. And church, the church in studies have been watching you. You're carrying on activity, activities of religion, but have not found your work perfect before God. As you look at the whole ramification of, of the totality of the revelation of the word of God, then you understand that the goal, the place we are going, and the place we want to reach, and the reason for ministry, everything is centered on this word, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. What a challenge the Lord has not directed us to look at Abraham, at Moses, at Joshua, at David, at Solomon. He doesn't want us to give excuse. If we're running in a race, and while we're running, some of us fell by the wayside. He doesn't want us to use the example of those who fell by the wayside and say, since Abraham fell by the wayside, what am I doing still running? Look at the almighty God and be therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Here we're running. And we have some people that ran before us. Here is Peter. Here is Matthew. Here is Demas. And here are these giants of the New Testament. And I caught Peter telling a lie. And then as we're running and here is Peter by the wayside. The tendency for you and for me and for every other person is to say, how can I be what I ought to be? See what Peter has done. And Jesus said, look up here. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. He has removed our eyes, our attention from every man and every woman. From every church leader. And from every church worker. And he has focused our gaze, our attention on the almighty God, our creator, our redeemer. And he says, no man is to be your perfect example. The almighty God is your father, is your creator. And is the one through Jesus Christ who has brought you to the kingdom. And therefore, whatever the shortcomings of other people, whatever stories you hear about other people, whatever the failures of other people, here is our Lord and Savior challenging us, commanding us, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. There are many churches here in this world. That's one of the churches where we are now. They call it Deeper Life Bible Church. And then we have some other denominations. And as you listen to, you know, all these various denominations. And then you hear what they emphasize. And you see some of the things that happen in their midst and in our midst as well. You're likely to sit back and to say, all this holiness and sanctification and perfection, I think judging by what I see and what I read and what I hear about all these churches and all the leaders of the churches, why am I bothering myself? You are bothering yourself because whatever churches do, whatever churches don't do, God says, I am God, I change not. 
He was perfect before the creation of Adam. And when Adam fell, he remained perfect. He was perfect before Israel came out of Egypt. And when they were in the wilderness and they did everything they did, he remained perfect. He was perfect before David committed adultery. He remained perfect after David committed adultery. He remained perfect after the death of David. He remained perfect at the end of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he remained perfect until today. Whatever churches are standing and whatever churches are falling, God remains perfect. And then Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ focuses your attention on the, Lord, on the Almighty God. And he says, be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Forget the stories you hear about men and women. And forget even your own shortcomings. Yesterday is gone. Last year is gone. All these other decades are gone. Now is today. And the commandment, the challenge is giving you today is whatever your weakness of the past, rise up today and look at the Almighty God. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. What a challenge and what a message. And what a wonderful thing to be able to stand on the word of God, whatever other people are preaching and whatever they are not preaching, to stand on this unchanging word of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to explain. That's why we're dealing with three points. Number one, divine precept and perception of Christian perfection. The precept and the perception. Number two, divine promise and provision for Christian perfection. Number three, disciples' pursuit and prayer for Christian perfection. And we'll come back to this, Matthew chapter 5, and we're looking at the precept and we're looking at the perception. The word precept means commandment. And the perception means how you perceive it, how you understand it. This perfection, what is it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, that's the word, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's the word again. It talks about human perfection. Be ye therefore perfect. Then it talks about divine perfection. As your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To start with, number one, there's confusion. Number two, there's perception. What's the confusion? The confusion is when people hear the word perfect, they think about angelic perfection. But you know angels live in a different realm. Where the angels are, Satan is no more there. Temptations are not there. Days and night are not there. Weariness and weakness are not there. Challenges and trials are not there. And the war and the conflicts are not there. They live in another realm. Angelic perfection is another thing. That's not what you're talking about here. Other people are confused because they're thinking of Adamic perfection. That he is the uh, perfection, Edenic perfection, the perfection in Eden. Before the serpent came, before Satan came, before the temptation came, before there was any sickness at all, because there was, before there was any brain problem at all, and before there was any kind of, uh, of, of trial that will weigh man down. Before the hospitals came on earth and before all the, all the problems of man compounded as we have today. When Adam and Eve were in Eden and there was perfect fellowship with the almighty God, Adamic perfection. That's not what we are talking about now. The world has changed. There is a Satan in the world now. There are demons in the world now. There is sin in the world now. There are temptations in the world now. There is sickness in the body of the of people in the world now. Things have changed in the world. This, we're not talking about Adamic perfection. We're not talking about angelic perfection. We're not talking about heavenly perfection either. You know, when everything, when the Holy Spirit is over, 
and the rapture has taken place and the dead in Christ has they have risen and then we which are alive we're all together up there and there will be no night there and there's no crying or weeping there and even the conditions there are totally perfect we're not talking about heavenly perfection after the, after the rapture we're talking about perfection here and now and that's different that's different and as you look at the at the word of god and you look at the way that the bible uses the word perfect and then it makes you understand what the lord is driving at when it says be ye therefore perfect what did he mean when he said what he said and let's look at and let's look at deuteronomy chapter 25. deuteronomy chapter 25 i'm reading to you from verse 15 in 25 15 of deuteronomy it says but thou shalt have a perfect and a just wage look at the word perfect there it's talking about the people that sell and it's talking about the kind of wage they use in measuring and weighing what they sell to us and it says you'll have a perfect wage and then immediately you see another word a just wage that means that the perfect is equal to the just if the weight is just then it is perfect if it is perfect then it is just that's the measurement that's what the lord is saying and then it goes on and it just measure shall thou have that thy days may be lengthened in the uh, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Look at Genesis chapter six. In Genesis chapter six, we're looking at verse nine. These are the generations of Noah. He was a just man and perfect in his generations. Do you see the use of those two words? He was just. He was perfect. It was perfect. It was just. That's what God is looking at. Perfection is, is not something that is so far away in the sky that our hands cannot touch. It says he was a just man. And he was also a perfect man. And Noah walked with God. That's the perfection the Lord was requiring, talking about. He walked with God. What does that mean to walk with God? Have you ever walked with somebody side by side? Going the same direction. You are walking together. And he's putting his feet one after the other. And you're putting your feet one after the other. And you're going that same direction. That's the perfection the Lord is talking about. He walked with God. Here are the commandments of the Lord. And he's walking according to the commandments and the dictates and the teaching of the Lord. That's the perfection that the Lord was talking about. That's how we perceive what the perfection is. Look at chapter 7, verse 1, Genesis. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou all, and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me. In this generation, that's the, that's the perfection. I've been watching you, Noah, and I've seen something practical from day to day. Righteousness. You have I seen righteous in this generation. That's the perfection that God expected of Noah. And that's the perfection he demonstrated. As you look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 20. Here, a young ruler, a rich man, came to the Lord. And then in verse 20, the young man says unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? This man wanted to get to the kingdom of God. And then the Lord told him, Keep the commandments. He said, Which? And the Lord told him, and then he said, Lord, I'm happy to tell you, I'm happy to report to you that as I check my life and check everything, all these have done consistently from my youth up. 
In verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, say, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. That's the perfection. Young man, you have a problem. Your money stands between you and your God. Your money holds you instead of you holding your money. Your money is your master instead of you mastering and using the money. Your money is sitting on the throne of your heart instead of God sitting on the throne of your heart. Get it out. Sell what you have. You see all those poor people? Give to them. Distribute the wealth so that the money is no more your God. And then put your heart on God. Then come and follow me. That's the perfection. If you'll be perfect, that's it. That's what you do. The perfection that the Lord was talking about is not something unreachable. It's not something untouchable. It's not something unattainable. You can do it. In fact, Peter said, Lord, when they saw that man that he went away, uh, when he said, if that is perfection, then count me out. I cannot do it. And he went away sorrowful. And Peter said, Lord, we have done that. We have left everything. This perfection you are talking about, we left everything and we are following you. What shall we have? And it says, those of you that have followed me, and money is not your God. And you put God above every other thing. And you rule over that thing, over the desire for money. You rule over it. It doesn't rule over you. All those of you that are perfect that way in this generation, in a generation to come, you reign with me over the 12 tribes of Israel. The perfection that the Lord was talking about is something that is very practical. And that's what he means. And then you come to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, the perception that we need to have, what he calls perfection. In 1 Kings chapter 8, reading from verse 61, Let your heart therefore be perfect for the Lord our God. What does that mean? I want you to do it. Tell me what it means. Read the next line. To walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. That's it. It says, look at us as we're keeping the commandments of God this day. Do tomorrow like you're doing it today. And then next tomorrow like tomorrow. Every day, let it be a day like this. Live a day at a time. I just wake up in the morning and say, Lord, my heart is towards you. I'm thinking about you. This is a new day. And with the few hours I have during this day, help me to live, help me to walk according to your commandment. That's the perfection. Read it again. Look at it in verse 61. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. That's the perfection. It's not talking about something unattainable. It's talking about something that others have done. Second Kings chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20, reading from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked with thee in truth and with a perfect heart. That's the perfection. Lord, remember me. I always walk in the truth. I always tell the truth. Because I know that you, God, you deserve truth from being what man. And I've always been living by this truth with a perfect heart. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. That's the perfection. To live in the truth. 
And to do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that's the perfection. And when this man prayed like that, he said, Lord, I walked with you in perfection. It came to pass a voice I was gone out into the middle court. That the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus says the Lord God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days 15 years. Think about that. Perfection. Just to walk in the truth. And then to do that which is good in his sight. First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. I'm reading there to you from verse 29, first, verse 19 rather, First Chronicles 29, verse 19. And give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart. If he has a perfect heart, what's going to be the result to keep thy commandments? That's all. That's the perfection we're talking about. Give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart. And when you give him that perfect heart, here this will be the result to keep thy commandments and to do all these and, and, then, and, thy, and thy testimonies and thy statutes and to do all these things and to build the palace. That's the perfection. The project God has in mind now is to, be a is to build a sanctuary for the glory of his name. Give Solomon, my son, a perfect heart that he will not have his own private agenda. That's all. He will not have his own private project. That's all. He will not have a selfish kind of desire, a selfish kind of accomplishment. That's all. That this project that is in the heart of God will be in the heart of of my son Solomon and he will do just that as God desires that's the perfection when you don't have a private agenda a selfish agenda and all you want is God's agenda all you want in life is what God wants whatever God doesn't want bye bye I abandon that what do I need to do with that whatever success and whatever accomplishment and whatever project God is not interested in my mind is away from it all I want is what God wants that's the perfection that we're talking about that's the perfection the Bible talks about and give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart to keep thy commandments and thy testimonies and thy statutes and to do all these things and to build the palace for the which I have made provision. Therefore, you understand then as we look at the word of God and it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. It's not talking about something unattainable. And the words are very emphatic. He wants us to be like God whose nature is love. Whose acts are acts of mercy and kindness and goodness. These words of Christ include both a commandment as well as a promise. What he commands, he also provides the means to accomplish and fulfill. That's why you find David here praying. And saying, Lord, eh, don't leave my son Solomon alone to himself. He cannot do it by himself. You need to help him. And since you have commanded it, you have provided for it as well. And as in God's infinite nature, there is no sin. Nothing but goodness and love. So in our finite nature, there should be no sin. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. And when God by his spirit lives, and lives in us and feels and rules our heart, totally influencing, controlling our hearts, totally influencing and controlling our hearts, that's perfection, that's perfection. When God by his spirit totally controls our hearts, follow me please. Here where we wake up in the morning and we want to live the whole day and living the whole day is like living one hour at a time. And you see, we sleep in the night for about eight hours, remaining only 16 hours. That's not much. 
And then each hour we say, Lord, just control me, just influence me. And you know the hour is not the hour is not that long when you break it into five, five minutes, twelve places. Just Lord, within the five minutes, I want to be under your control, under your influence. I don't want to say anything or do anything or plan just these five minutes, Lord. I don't want to plan anything contrary to your will. I just want to be under your influence. These five minutes, that's not hard. And then when the five minutes are over, Lord, you did it this last five minutes. How about the next five minutes? And then when you do that 12 times, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, that's one hour. And you can be under the control of the spirit of God and just say, not, not my will, not my mind, not my desire, not my project, not what I like. Just, 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 just the influence of God alone for one hour. And by the time you do that, hour after hour after hour, a few hours, the day is over. And if you're able to be under the control of God for this day, then you, before you sleep at night, God, how I thank you so much. Today was laid under your influence. My thought under your influence. My action under your influence. My words under your influence. A day at a time. Lord, I'm sleeping now. Watch over me. Then you, you wake up the following morning. Then you remember yesterday. How wonderful it is to be under the influence of God for the whole day. And then an hour at a time for this new day, you just live, you just live. You are walking with God. God, should I say that? God, should I go there? God, should I do this? God, should I reply him? God, what should I tell him? God, should I get involved in this? Just lead me, just guide me. A moment at a time, an hour at a time. You can live a righteous life, a day at a time. And within seven days, one week is gone. Then one month is gone. Just walking with God. That's the perfection we're talking about. Under the control of God. Under the influence of the Spirit of God. Not being independent from God. Not being isolated, detached from God, but in fellowship, in unity, working with God. That's the perfection. We come to point number two. In point number two, we come to the divine promise and provision for Christian perfection. We come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, if, if you hear Jesus Christ, his word will produce the result in your life. Have you noticed that the words of Jesus, they always produce results? Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. I will be thou clean. Just the word produce cleanliness in that man. And see this man that is, that is blind. What do you want me to do unto you? Lord, that I might receive my sight. Receive your sight. His word always produce the power to effect and to work out whatever he said. And then even those who are died, he just came in and he said, why are you making this much ado? The, the girl is not dead, the damsel is not dead, but he's sleeping and they laughed him to scorn. And he went in there and he said, Talita Komai, I said unto you, rise up. His word always produced the result. And if you accept his word, the word of command, if it says, be thou clean, it will produce the result. If it says, rise up, it produces the result. It says, stretch out your hand to that man in the synagogue. It produces the result. Lazarus, come forth. It produces the results. The words of Jesus always produce the result. And if you accept this word and say, Lord, speak this word to me. Let me hear you. Be ye therefore perfect. You're telling me that I accept. It will produce a result. But you see, it's the people that do not know the 
power and the effect and the influence of the words of Jesus. Those are the people that do not have the result in their lives. But when you come with an open heart, when you come with a desire, and you know you are coming before the creator of the heavens and the earth because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God without him was nothing made that was made it was through him that spoken word and living word that the almighty God spoke and the whole universe came into existence it's the word of power and here is Jesus Christ and he speaks the word to you and he says be ye therefore perfect Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I accept that. I accept that. And when you accept that word of Jesus, it produces the life of perfection and the, the word of obedience and the word of righteousness and holiness in your life. His word has the power to produce whatever he desires. And as you see, the, uh, look at Second Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel chapter 22. Here are people, flesh and blood and bones like you and I. Here is the testimony. In Second Samuel chapter 22, reading from verse 31. Second Samuel 22, reading from verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. It's a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God except God? Save God. And who is a rock? Save our God. God is my strength and my power. God is my strength and my power. If that's, if that's the reality in your life, everything then is possible. Look at what follows. And then it says, he maketh my way perfect he god the god of the whole universe and the one who is my strength and my power he maketh my way perfect jeremiah chapter 32 in jeremiah chapter 32 reading from verse 27 jeremiah 32 27 behold i am the lord the god of all flesh is there anything too hard for me? You know, maybe I've told you before, to eat an elephant, you divide the elephant into little, little bits. You cut the elephant into little, little small bites. And you chew a little at a time. And that's why, say, so you divide the whole day into little, little bits. Lord, you want me to be perfect for this whole day? I divide the day into small, small bits, five minutes at a time. Lord, is it too hard for you to make me righteous, holy, perfect? Just live a wonderful life, Christ-like life, five minutes. No, that's easy. Even your little faith can take that. And then the next five minutes, and then the next five minutes, that's how you eat an elephant. You eat an elephant bit by bit, little by little. And God says, I can do that in your life. I can carry you. I can carry your burden. I can, I can make your life what it ought to be just a little at a time. It's the God of the whole universe. Nothing too hard for him. Verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. My own will not be too hard for God. I just give God my heart, my life, my future, everything. And I say, Lord, I have a project. The project is to be perfect. And I know you can do it. Because Jesus commands me. And he said, be thou perfect. Even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. This is the one single project I need to face. That I need to address myself to. And then I want your power. Every five minutes. Every, every moment of my life. And little by little as I walk a step at a time. Somebody talks to me. And before I answer I say, Lord, help me to know how to answer so that this project of perfection, of holiness, of righteousness, I will not leave the project. Nothing else is important to me. 
This is the single project that is, uh, that is important to me in life. If it's land or money or opportunity or ministry or anybody is arguing about something with me, I drop those things for my project. Nothing will be essential to me anymore. They might cheat me. They might insult me. That's not, going to, that's not as important as my project. The project I have is this project of being there for perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And every other thing that competes with that project in my life, Lord, I give up. It's not important. How important will that other thing be when I step out of this world and I cross the line into eternity? The only project that will matter, the only, thing, the only assignment that will matter when I cross that line and I cross to the other side of eternity is this project of being therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Therefore, every other thing that competes with this, I drop. Oh Lord, give me the detachment. The, 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 disinterest, the disinterest I don't have any interest in any other thing anymore And when you don't have any interest in them They won't, they won't bother you They won't tempt you they won't, uh, they won't oppress you If you're not interested in them anymore And the only interest you have Is this project Lord, I want to be like my heavenly father And then step by step Moment after moment and day after day. All the only thing this the only thing that is important. Never argue with anybody about anything. What if you gained the whole world and you lost your soul? What will you give in exchange for your soul? Better drop all those things and hold on to this one single project. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And then, when you cross the line to the other side of eternity, and then you look back and you look at every day, the challenge of every day, and the problem of every day. And you saw that you abandoned all those other things. And then you had detachment from them. They didn't attach themselves to you. And the only thing that was important, you come to the other side. And all your other colleagues, friends, and neighbors. When they cross to the other side, all the things they were holding on to in the world. That didn't allow them to prepare for eternity. All that is gone. We cannot bury each of them. And then when you get to the other side, your holiness goes with you. The righteousness goes with you. The project, this perfection, this nature of Christ, this nature of God goes along with you. And the only thing they'll be looking for when we get to the other side is not the salary you earned here when you were here. It's not the name, the title you bore when you were here. It's not the position you held when you were here. It's not the, the, the kind of house you lived in when you were here. The only thing they'll be looking for when we get to the other side is this perfection. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Why then don't you just, if anything competes with this thing we're talking, just drop those things and say, those things will not matter, will not have any value in 50 years time, in 100 years time. This one single thing that will have value in eternity, that's what I want. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What's the promise or the provision in Ezekiel chapter 36? Ezekiel chapter 36, we're looking at verse 25. Ezekiel 36, reading from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. The Lord says, if I sprinkle clean water upon you, you'll be clean. That's the perfection. That's the holiness. That's the new nature. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And then it says, And from all your filthiness will I cleanse you, and from all your idols, and a new heart will I give unto you. 
If God had told you, I'll give you a million naira, a million, a million dollars or rush and say, God, now, now, now give me. But when he says, I'll give you a new heart, how many times have you prayed? Do you value a new heart more than one million dollars? Do you value a new heart more than having a good wife? Do you value a new heart more than having a good husband? Do you value a new heart more than having opportunity for ministry? And yet, this is the important thing. And these are the promises that the Lord has given. And these are the provision that the Lord has made. And he says, I'll give you a new heart. You know, if, if we set our values right, if we put the first things first, if we exalt what God exalts, if we appreciate what God appreciates, if we devalue and put behind us and relegate to the background what God counts unimportant, the promise will be fulfilled in a very short time. But you know, many people, they put the cart before the horse. And they put money ahead of the new heart. And they put education above the new heart. And they put position, privilege above the new heart. And they put the respect of men and the appreciation of men and women around them above the new heart. If we turned it around and we put us number one, the thing that God puts us number one, and he says, a new heart. Because you know, the house, the money, the education, the certificate, everything, even the job, will not go with you to heaven. Even if you gained all the money in the world, what you are putting as number one will not follow you to heaven. But the one that will open the gate of heaven for you, a new heart, also will I give unto you. If we put that as number one, and we say, let the other people struggle and fight over whatever they want to fight on. This is the one single need I want. Well, have it. But you know, it's because the church, and I mean the church at large, the church at large, and this church as well, Young and old, men and women, it's because, you know, the, the things that, you know, we pray about, we fast about, we struggle about, we run after. They know more the things that, that will matter in heaven. That's why we don't have what we ought to have. I pray things will change. And in your heart also, in saying also, it means I've given you, verse 25, that's salvation. But also, there's another thing we call sanctification. Christian perfection. Holiness of heart. Holiness of nature. I've given you salvation. I've cleansed you from all your idols. But in your heart also, will I give unto you. Sanctification is a subsequent experience. It's not the same as salvation. This Christian perfection is not the same as Christian birth, as a new birth, as being born again. It's a different thing. And it says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit. And if we value the new spirit more than new clothes, we'll have it. But you know, we want new shoes and new clothes. A new property, a new car. That's what we are. That's what we are running after. That's why we're poor spiritually. That's poverty. We're almost starving. We have the Bible. We come to Bible study, but we're empty. We're shallow because we're looking for this new thing, new thing, new thing, and the new heart. That God says I will give you has not become the number one in our lives. But he says a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And then he tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. 
Reading from verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify. He gave himself that he might sanctify. Sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it a glorious church. Stop there for a moment. Many people in many churches have stopped even thinking about a glorious church. Even desiring to have a glorious church. Even making any effort that the church they belong to will be glorious. It's like most people just see church is church. And there's no way church can be perfect. That's what people say. That's what they think. They don't even make any effort. They don't even offer any prayer. They don't even show any desire. And if there is any imperfection, any iniquity, any sin, anything that is, uh, that, is not, that is not glorious, that is disgraceful, they just laugh about it and say, well, what, what do you think? Are you thinking that, you know, even our church deeper life, are you thinking that we'll have a glorious, you know, such a pure, holy church? Oh, human beings are human beings. That's what they say. And whenever they hear there is something inglorious there, something disgraceful there, something that is dirty there, something that's of iniquity there, something that is not appropriate there, you know, they just shrug their shoulders and go their way. And then they find somebody, oh God, cleanse our church. Oh God, make us glorious, make us pure, make us holy. They say, wait, what's the problem with you? You want to kill yourself because of church? glorious church is no more in their in their agenda but you know the reason why christ gave himself is so that we'll have a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish if you have the mind of Christ and the desire of the Lord, this is what he wants. That's why he said, be ye there for individuals as well as families, as well as the whole church. Be ye there for perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. He wants a glorious church. See Christ hanging on the cross and see his agony. And see all the all the shouts and all the pain that he had. My father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See all the people going about and jeering and making fun and saying, If you be the son of God, come down from the cross. Why did he stay on the cross? Why did he hang in there? And he said, I thirst. And the agony, it was the agony of death. And then the pain of the crown of thorns on the head. And he remained there so that he'll have a glorious church. Is it nothing to you that Christ went through such agony and such pain? And he says, Lord, this is tough. This is difficult. If this cup cannot pass by me, except I drink it, that will be done. Why did he drink such a bitter cup that the church will be glorious? Holy, without blemish, not having any spot. And then are you not concerned? Will you leave Christ there in all the agony? And it doesn't bother you what he went through. He gave himself that he might sanctify and cleanse the church or the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It will be done. We come to point number three, the pursuit and the prayer. The pursuit and the prayer. In Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6. Reading from verse 1, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. 
living the principles, living the rudiments, living the first things about repentance, about water baptism, about salvation, about Christian living, about the rudimentary, rudimentary things, the initial things, living all those uh, first principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. You know, the children of Israel, the reason why they were not able to get to Canaan is because they couldn't bring themselves up to leave the wilderness. As long as they had some manner to gather up in the morning, they didn't appreciate Canaan. They didn't understand. As long as water came out of the rock for them, and they all drank and they sank, what a wonderful God. As long as water came and they drank, that was all, you know, the, the vision, little minds are impressed by little things. Small minds are impressed and just, they are just, they are excited by small, small things. You know, they had a cup in their hand and they went to the rock and they got their cup of water and they drank. That, that was all for them. And it shut off the desire to go to the land of Canaan. And then they woke up in the morning And then you have manna here Manna there And everybody gathered And then they went to the kitchen And they baked And how sweet this is Little things satisfy Little minds And they never want to leave that Who wants to leave the manna And leave the water out of the rock Who wants to go to Canaan But let us leave all the principles of these little, little things we've been talking about all this while. And let us go on unto perfection. Pursue it. Desire it. And be excited about it. And just say, Lord, this is what I want. Perfection. To have the mind of Christ in man. And to have the nature of God in man And for the Lord to deep his sand in your heart And say now that you want to allow me to do something I'm going to do something in your heart Now that you are leaving everything behind And you are leaving the first principles of the doctrine of Christ And then you are ready And then you put all the weights aside And everything that will hinder you Everything that will tie you down And say bye bye, bye bye To all those things, the first principles Even the good things of the past I'm going on to perfection. And then you set your gaze and you, and you set your face as a fleet. And say, this is what I want. This is where I'm going. And nothing will stop me. And nothing will drive me back. We're going on to perfection. Can we do that? Rise up and tell the Lord. Your pursuit. Your desire, your heart, your heartache, and your goal, and the thing that you are panting after, and you are saying, God, I need this. Long, long time we have stayed around Kadesh Bania. Long, long time we have stayed around the rock just bringing water. Long time we have stayed around just having healing, and just having this, and just having that. But now we are leaving all these things behind, and we are going on to perfection. The Lord is calling you to perfection, and the Lord is saying, This is what. He wants to do give the lord a chance give the lord a chance and let him reach down to your heart at your soul and to your mind and say lord this is what i want all the little little things all the small small things that interest the little minds leave all those things behind and say lord we're moving on we want to go into perfection will the church be weak just because of you Will the church be dirty just because of you? Will the church be inglorious just because of you? Will the church be imperfect just because of you? But if you, if you say, we well, want a glorious church, we we'll want a spotless church, we we'll want a church without blemish, we we'll want a church that has the mind of Christ and that has the nature of Christ and that has the very image of God. This is the kind of church we we'll want. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And then in your heart was striving after that perfection you are running after that perfection you are pursuing after that perfection you are saying oh lord oh lord oh lord you'll do this for me i want to leave the things behind the things of the past they are gone i want you now to put your 
power, the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, and the power that makes a person what he ought to be, that perfection, that purification, that sanctification, that holiness, the very nature of God in man. Oh Lord, I'm ready, I'm ready. I want it from you, and I want you, Lord, to so sanctify, purify, make me holy, that now, every moment of my life, every minute of my life, every hour of my life, step by step, and day after day, I don't have any other agenda just this single project in my life perfection perfection christian perfection the nature of god in my heart and the life of god in my heart in the day and in the night with my wife with my husband with my children with my parents in my school in my place of work on the street in the bus that lord every moment i'll be conscious of your influence i'll be conscious of control i'll be conscious of the fact that i want to live a life approved unto god a life that is perfect a life that is righteous a life without sin a life without all these shortcomings a life without any excuse a life that is lived that is lived by the grace of god in the grace of god a life of righteousness a life of just seeking the glory of god a life of seeking the kingdom of god and his righteousness a life that is totally abandoned totally abandoned to the will of god to the mind of god to the word of god a life that is dedicated and yielded unto you a life that is not interested in the mundane things of this world a life that does not put the mundane things of this world as number one but a life that puts the kingdom of god as number one a life that puts the nature of god as number one a life that puts the desire of the almighty god as number one a life that puts the word of christ before me all the time be ye therefore perfect be ye therefore perfect be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect i want to be part of a glorious church not part of a dirty church not part of a sinful church not part of a, a kind of careless church that doesn't have any desire to follow after the things of the Lord Lord I want our church to be glorious and I want to be part of that glorious church glorious within and glorious without glorious in my heart glorious in my language and glorious in my perception and glorious in everything within me in the day and in the night in the public bleak and in the private when people see me when they don't see me when they don't see the things i do and when they see the things i do what they think will not be what's in my heart what they think will not matter to me at all the only thing that will matter to me is that the almighty god is watching everything i do and i want him to give me a perfect heart a yielded heart a holy life a sanctified life a life that is fully laid on the altar a life that cares nothing for the comment of men a life that cares nothing for the attitude of people a life that is totally yielded attached unto the heavenly things it's a life that is detached detached from all the things of this life a life that is just having this single project seeking the kingdom of god and his righteousness and having this perfection of heart this perfection of soul this perfection of spirit this perfection of attitude and this perfection of disposition oh lord this is what i want i want you to do it for me i want you to do it for me more than a new car more than a new house more than a wife more than husband more than children more than anything on this earth oh lord this is my desire this is what i want be ye therefore perfect be ye therefore perfect be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect what the people of the world are doing will not interest me their temptations will not interest me their enticements will not interest me and their praise will not interest me and their blame will not interest me and all their pranks and all their all the evil things they do will not interest me their power their politics their position their authority will not interest me all i want all i want is this thing that jesus christ died to provide that's why jesus suffered that's why jesus died that's why he hung on the cross and he said father my god my god why have you forsaken me are you going to abandon the agony of christ and the suffering of christ and the pain that christ went through are you not going to say because of his death on the cross because of his pain on the cross and because of everything that he went through i want this perfection i want this perfection i want 
days perfection be ye therefore perfect be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect he said i'll speak with clean water upon you and then he says you'll be clean he said from all your cleanness all your filthiness and all your idols he says i will cleanse you and then he says i'll give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh. And give you the heart of flesh. What a promise he has given. What a privilege we have. And what a glorious sin the Lord has promised us. If we just leave all those small things behind. All those rudimentary things behind. And all those uh, unimportant things behind. All those things of no eternal value behind. And then we're reaching forth. And we're moving on. And we put our eye, our mind, our focus, our gaze. And we set our face as a fleet. And we're going beyond to that perfection. Let's move on to perfection. Move on to perfection. And just abandon all these unimportant things. All these things that are not of eternal value. And let your heart, your soul, your mind just center on this glorious thing the Lord has provided. And then you're praying and you're saying, Lord, this will be number one in my request. This will be number one in my desire. This will be number one in my possession. This will be number one in my experience. This will be number one in my relationship with you. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect.